Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest in our round of cultural meetings. Uh, very honored tonight to have the Russian artist uh, Pavel Odelnov. Um, I met Pavel a few weeks ago when I went to Pushkin House, which is the Russian cultural center, uh, which is independent of the Russian government. Um, it's well worth visiting. It's near Holborn. It has a very good bookshop and regular exhibitions and so on. And Pavel was exhibiting a collection there, which was um, in three sections. One, one was about the Soviet Union and what had happened in the late Soviet Union. The other section was about the war. And the third section was, um, I, I think, really about utopias and his generation, how his generation felt in Russia. It was, I was really impressed by the exhibition and asked Pavel if he'd be interested in talking to us about his art. And um, Pavel left Russia um, because he was opposed to the war, now lives in London. Um, I have to say his artwork, I thought, was really, really very good. Um, and he's got a great um, corpus of work behind him. In Russia, he had exhibited regularly and he had paintings in several of the major galleries. So very pleased to have you, Pavel. And um, over to you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for this invitation, and I'm happy to, to be here and to speak to you. So maybe I will try to tell about, about myself in general terms, and about my approach, and uh, tell something about my projects. So let's start my presentation, maybe. Yeah. It works. Mm. Can you see my presentation? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the first I have to say uh, maybe some words about my approach. Uh, for me, art is a way to tell stories. I use very different media. I practice installations, video, photography, and texts. I use different ways of narration but my main medium is painting. I try to show different points of view. That's why my projects contain different chapters and consist of many different stories. And that's why they are so big scale. I will focus on my latest works. I'll tell you about uh, some episodes, some stories from my projects. So the first one is from Zona. Uh, the word me means industrial area. Uh, I spent four years working on this project. Uh, it's uh, about very typical industrial area with very typical problems. Typicals for post-Soviet space and maybe not only post-Soviet space. Um, I was born in Dzerzhinsk. It's a capital of Soviet chemistry. It's a small city. Uh, 350 kilometers from Moscow. A lot of factories were built there in the 1930s during the industrialization period. Uh, first time it was production, uh, it produced production for military purposes uh, like chemical weapons. And after the war for peaceful purposes, after the Second World War for peaceful purposes, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, workshops were left. Some of the factories were closed. This is uh, the Labour dynasty. Um, my father is uh, the smallest one here. Uh, the core of uh, the project is the story of my family. Three generations of my family worked for chemical industries in Zerzhinsk. My father spent almost 40 years working on different chemical factories. He told me a lot of stories about his experience. Once uh, he made invitation uh, for me uh, to one of the factories. Uh, together we tried to find one of his workshops, but it was demolished already in the uh, 90s, in 1990s. 
there was only grass on that place. I realized that I know almost nothing about those factories and uh, about this part of my family life. And I realized that the memory sleeps like, um, like sand through my fingers. Then I decided to start my project. I met different people in Zerzhinsk, local historians, historians, psychologists, uh, former workers. I spent a lot of time in libraries. I learned uh, photo archives and read books. And I had interviews with my relatives too. I made a film, Subjects of Memory, uh, with uh, that interviews. I found, uh, uh, yes, one of the photos from that archives is, uh, it was classified, this photo was classified in Soviet times. Sorry. I have to accept somebody is coming. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I have to accept somebody. No, it's okay. I've done it. Yeah. Could you do it? Somebody is coming to the room. Yeah. So I found that photo. It was classified in Soviet times. And uh, it's an equipment for pro producing mustard gas, a very toxic and dangerous chemical weapon. It was very efficient in the, sec in the First World War. And in uh, the 30s, 1930s, people were sure it's the most dangerous weapon. In the late 30s, Zerzhinsk factory started to produce this poison. My grandmother worked in uh, the same workshop, but only for one month, happily for one month. Now we know that no one side used this weapon during the Second World War. After the war, workshops were conserved, but a lot of workers lost their health. Here, this equipment is waiting for its destiny. Happily, it was fully liquidated in uh, the early 90s, 1990s. So let's turn to people. Here is the voting. Workers raising their hands to support some decision of the Communist Party. And of course, they do it as needed anonymously. It was a kind of illusion of democracy, of course, not real democracy. Of course, uh, this image is connected with nowadays events in Russia. The wall of fame. Walls of fame were everywhere in the Soviet Union, near any factory and any organization. I found a lot of portraits in, of the best workers in Zerzhinsk newspapers of Soviet times. And I made paintings based on those photos. I realized that portraits are very artificial. They are constructed as images of propaganda. And propaganda made real, made real persons invisible in those portraits. Uh, I even did not recognize my grandmother when I saw her on that photos. He's my grandmother. Let's turn to factories. Here's a painting with my grandmother's workshop of plexiglass. She built it in the early 40s. And uh, she has been working there for about 30 years. Now it's abandoned. Uh, his uh, desertionate workshop. It's one of the most toxic productions in uh, Zerzhinsk. Uh, and Chlor, Fosgen, and other toxic components were in the production process. My father was working when I was a child there. I remember he was always yellow after work day. I remember a bucket in the kitchen with boiling sheets. 
everything around was yellow and this workshop is yellow too oh i'm sorry something wrong yes yes Yes, it works. Something wrong with it this time. My father told a lot of stories about his experiences. Some of his stories were very fun. Uh, some were sad and even tragic. When I started my project, I asked my father to write his stories. He was very excited about this. And we made a book of his memories. It's called No Entrance Without Gas Mask. Uh, in his stories became a part of my project. I show that stories with my paintings of ruins. Uh, it's like two very different points of view together, called romantic ruins and stories about people and events which were inside those buildings many years ago. So some of my paintings there. I show it with my father's stories. Um, it's written on the facade, uh, glory to labor and science. His uh, the herbicide workshop. Herbicide needs to eliminate plants and grass alongside railroads. Uh, the waste of this production was so toxic, it was possible to bury it uh, not less than one kilometer under the ground. But now you can see trees on the roof of that building. Nature wins. So the black hole, the black hole, it's about the black hole. It's uh, not a astronomic thing. It's, uh, it's a folk name of a reservoir for sludge, sludge reservoir, illegal sludge reservoir near Zerzhensk. In the 1990s, the black hole was listed in the Guinness Book for of uh, World Records as the most polluted small lake in the world. The black hole is fenced with barbed wire here uh, and uh, coming close to, uh, to it may cause harm to health, it's dangerous. The painting shows a fence built around this famous location. And I also made a film about chemical waste. It's a screenshot from that film. It names from white sea to black hole. The surfaces of sludge look like surfaces of other planets. I made this film with a drone. This point of view uh, from the drone maybe is the only way to observe that vast contaminated uh, areas. So I had nine shows of this project uh, and uh, more information you can find on uh, the website of this project from zona.site. Bro, dick tricks this time. Yeah, shoot your mouth a little fool. I'm going to dance on your head. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I improved my artistic method in another project, bringing trays. I made this project in the frames of the six Biennale or Ural's Biennale of Contemporary Art. Uh, they invited me uh, to our art residence program to create a new work. Uh, radioactivity and radioactive contamination are invisible and ringing means the alarm signal alarm signal of the Geiger counter. You can hear ringing when there is a lot of radioactivity. It means danger. Uh, my project is about people who were engaged in the Soviet atomic project on Urals, about the price and consequences uh, of the atomic project. The second nuclear production after the United States started there in the South Urals in uh, uh, 1940s. 
it's a place far away from everything about three hours from big cities in a very beautiful area between lakes uh, it's between Yekaterinburg and Chelyabinsk cities the place on this photo is a dormitory of scientists uh, of the secret laboratory B I made a total installation there so it was a classified place classified place and uh, until now you cannot visit it if you are not a citizen of russia it's a no dis non-disclosure agreement it's a special document for soviet people who worked in that secret place you couldn't tell anything to other people about about nuclear technologies you couldn't speak uh with foreign people with without special permission you cannot uh, cross the border and if somebody asks you about something you must say to kgb i made a lot of copies of this document and it was like an invitation to my exhibition now, i asked everybody to sign it before <laughs> visiting so i read a lot of books uh, about nuclear uh, soviet nuclear project and about this place too and so my project is based on declassified and published documents and i decided to make my project as a short stories one room is is, uh, is the one story i made 21 rooms 21 installations i made those two rooms half opened like on this photo my exhibition exhibition opens with the story about the first uh, explosion of atomic bomb before Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki in American uh, Almagordo desert uh, in July 1945. Uh, so it's the core of a nuclear bomb, the small sphere uh, made of plutonium. Plutonium is an artificial element. It doesn't exist uh, in nature in real nature so it was built a lot of infrastructure new factories cities and railroads to create this small ball uh, the soviets stole a lot of american documents of the manhattan project and started their own nuclear project i made two paintings uh, and placed them one opposite to another with two very similar pluton plutonium factories one in uh, Hanford site in uh, the United States and another one in Azersk in Urals. But Soviets made, uh, made, made some innovation. <laughs> Engineer Nikolai Delijal just was just playing with the matchbox and he decided to turn the reactor vertical way whilst uh, the american nuclear reactor was horizontal later this innovation was used in almost all new reactors in all over the world this is a very authentic matchbox of the same year 1945 we are for the peace written on it it were thousand thousands prisoners of gulag on construction of the first nuclear plant so no special machines only picks and shovels uh, those are people started this uh, this soviet nuclear nuclear project next rooms are about the secrecy mode this one is with quotes from private letters sent from the secret nuclear city uh from declassified archive of kgb uh, they were censored for the secret information inside some of them like fairy tales something in those letters is unbelievable uh, here i compare soviet map where is an empty place between lakes maybe just some old villages and uh, nothing special nothing interesting but uh there's a city uh, in real of that place yeah and 
and uh, American satellite shot made in uh, 1960s. It's de declassified now. Uh, you can see a lot of details there. Uh, all the factories and uh, the city, everything in that photo is very, isn't very high resolution. So one of the main installations is uh, it names Eort, E U R T. Uh, it uh, means East Urals uh, radioactive trace. It's about uh, the first radioactive catastrophe. It happened on 29th of uh, uh, September, 1957. One of the reservoirs with radioactive waste overheated and exploded. Uh, the re radioactive trace of fallout was from this explosion was really huge, about 300 kilometers long. Happily, it didn't touch big cities, but there were a lot of villages there. People in those villages didn't know anything about radioactivity. And here on the wall, I, I made a map on the wall and burned this trace uh, like the real trace on, on maps, on radioactive ma maps of that time. That day, a lot of people saw. Oh, yes. Maybe I have to say about villages. Those the villages were relocated. Uh, here are crossed out names of relocated villages with uh, paintings based on photos, uh, on old photos of residents. It's like their memories. That day, 29th of September, 1957, a lot of people saw red and blue shining in the sky. It was an effect named as Cherenkov, uh, Cherenkov radioactive glow. Uh, the official newspaper wrote an article about this shining, but the newspaper said it was polar lights uh, to calm down people, to calm down people only. I made an installation with this article. Uh, you can see it uh, on this photo. And uh, polar lights, imitation of polar lights. And another tragedy was uh, radioactive contamination of the river, of the small river teacher. The first years, nuclear factory. Uh, leaked waste to the river Techa. Uh, there were a lot of big villages on the banks of this river. I made a copy of the concrete sign and made this installation. There were a lot of indigenous people in that area. Those are people paid for the nuclear project with their health and life. The next part is about research. This painting with a dog is about radioactive experiments with animals. It was a special by channel, by channel in the first nuclear reactor for those experiments. It, uh, so dogs got extremely high doses of radiation there. Scientists learned about impact of radiation. Dogs are sensitive to radiation as human. Dogs paid for nuclear project too. And one of the chapters is about the very famous German and Soviet scientist Timofey Frisovsky. He worked in the Institute of the Brain in the Soviet Union. During 30s and early 40s, he worked in Germany. After the Second World War, he was arrested by Soviets and he spent half of a year in Gulag. There, then he was involved in the Soviet nuclear project and came to that place. He worked on genealogy problems and learned the impact of radiation on chromosomes. 
the interesting thing, genealogy was prohibited in late 40s in Soviet Union, but not for Risovsky. He continued working here, uh, I mean, in that laboratory B, in that place in Urals, because it was a uh, closed place. It was a very special place. His research were very important for saving human lives. His main object was a fruit fly, uh, Drosdafila. Uh, I drew a human set of chromosomes uh, with fruit flies, with a lot of fruit flies. That's wrong. Yes, I painted uh, that place, the place I've never been. I even didn't see photos from there. Uh, it's a secret place. It's a collection of human tissues, uh, a repository, tissues of all workers of uh, Ural nuclear factories who were irradiated. Uh, I painted it by imagination. Um, it was impossible to get photos of that, that place. For me, it's a kind of memorial for people who were involved to in, in nuclear project. So I finished my exhibition with this painting based on a Soviet photo. Nuclear workers near the poster. Let uh, the atom be a worker, not a soldier. Of course, I want to sign for it. Uh, and we with the owner of uh, the building of uh, that laboratory B made this exhibition permanent. Uh, and uh, of course, more information you can find on my website. I uh, had idea to continue this topic and create exhibition about uh, the Cold War, about some episodes of the Cold War. Uh, but uh, the real war happened uh, one year ago, and uh, it was impossible uh, to think about something else. And uh, maybe uh, this topic was not so not so good <laughs> for for that moment. So here yeah, I am with the poster. It's a madness. Uh, First days in Moscow after uh, Russia launched this war against Ukraine, it was uh, really terrible, terrible days. And uh, it's against common sense. And you cannot do anything. You cannot protest. Uh, you cannot uh, go to street because a, new, a lot of new laws and new restrictions. And it was really dangerous uh, to to say something against it, but I managed it. It was uh, for myself, of course, it's, uh, it, it was impossible for myself to, to do it. And I made that poster. It's a madness with the letter Z, like uh, the uh, symbol of this innovation. Uh, and I came out, uh, and I was uh, standing there at the, at this poster during one one hour uh, near metro station, not far from my home. So I was ready to to go to jail, of course, uh, but happily, <laughs> happily I saved. So I left Russia. And uh, first days, it was impossible to continue doing something. And I started just drawing uh, something from news, from uh, photos from this war. And uh, it's a serious hands of war, just hands of different people, people in Bucha, for example, who got killed. And people of Kir and Lera who were killed with bomb in Odessa. Mom, mom and child. 
and uh, uh, fingers with that letter Z on uh, pro Putin's uh, meeting and uh, Putin's hand holding the desk. And it was, of course, it was more, more paint, more drawings. Later, I came to um, to images. Maybe I decided to create images, how I feel it, how I feel this time. It was like diary for me. So some ideas. Uh, this uh, an idea of the special path, the special way of the country. It names the path. Of course, it's uh, uh, propaganda uh, idea of the special path. Russia, of course, is its official carpet. This road goes to nowhere, and this one is a dictator. Dictator sitting somewhere in the snows in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and the city, because it, it was after I saw uh, ruins of Mariupol, and uh, grandparents of my wife were, were there in Mariupol during two months. We have, have, had no connection with them. It's about Orthodox Church names the coach and the fans. The fans, of course, it's uh, about. For me, it's about uh, new Iron Curtain and uh, the idea that everybody is against us. We have to to build the fans. We have to. Uh, to keep the border, and it's the main idea of Putin's time, I think. The fence, this wall, and the TV set in the middle of nowhere. TV set with uh, Swan Lake on TV. Swan Lake was a uh, uh, ballot uh, during the cold in 1991. And it became a kind of mem, became a kind of uh, symbol of revolution. And the last uh, painting uh, is about flag. It's after after washing, after washing, it's became without red stripe. <laughs> but you, but it's little bit raw, so you can see that. State of of right. So it's about future, maybe about future time. And I made a small exhibition in Sweden. I was in Sweden uh, in the spring last year because I had another exhibition in uh, museum in Uppsala. I opened that exhibition, one of the exhibition of, exhibitions of Promzona. I opened it uh, before the war, before war started, and I came back to Sweden when the, the war started, when Russia launched the full-scale war against Ukraine. So I came to Sweden and uh, I made all that series there, and I made a new exhibition in Kalmar Museum of uh, Contemporary Art. So acting out, uh, the idea to create exhibition in London, in Pushkin House was, uh, we discussed this idea maybe a couple of years ago and I thought about uh, that idea to, to create exhibition about uh, the Cold War, about some episodes of the Cold War. And uh, of course, when the real war started, I turned to nowadays topic. And here is uh, also you know, carpet, uh, red carpet. 
its uh, official symbol. My exhibition starts in uh, the basement. So it's a kind of bunker of, of my exhibition. We are going down on this painting name the bunker. I found this bunker uh, under Moscow. It's one of uh, declassified bunkers. Uh, I visited that place. Some of uh, paintings I created based on my my ideas I made earlier in Sweden, and this is the path. It's a big, big painting. And this is the nuclear briefcase. It looks like something abstract, uh, like uh, just colorful buttons. But it's a nuclear briefcase. It's a special case which contains special codes to launch uh, atomic as nuclear arsenal of the country. I found real uh, nuclear briefcase in Boris Yeltsin's museum, and I made a copy of that briefcase. So it's from the first part of my exhibition. It's about history and uh, historical background of this war in Ukraine. In it, it uh, names money. It's about missiles silos. Missile silos which are, became empty after the agreement with uh, the United States. It was uh, agreement named START of 1991. And uh, after that agreement, uh, both sides destroyed uh, most powerful weapons, uh, most powerful missiles. And uh, that Silas became empty. Uh, so, and there is another story behind this painting too. Uh, the story of different reforms, money, economical reforms. In late Soviet time, it was a big reform when uh, uh, government took all the money from people. It was uh, they had to change the to, to new banknotes, but they had only uh, two days, or maybe three days, to exchange money to new banknotes, and it was uh, possible to exchange only. Uh, 1,000 rubles. It's about two or three salaries of that time. It's almost nothing. And uh, after that reform and first reforms of Boris Yeltsin's time, uh, it was a lot of paper money, a lot of banknotes everywhere in all storages uh, in banks. And uh, it was a problem. Uh, how to deal with that uh, paper money, uh, maybe uh, just to be honest, but it's not just paper, it uh, contains a lot of metal and uh, it's dangerous to be on it and it's hard to be on it. And they decided just to put it uh, into the missile silences. So it's a real story. I, uh, there are some uh, silences filled with uh, Soviet money uh, it's very deep. It's about more than 40 meters down and it's filled with uh, paper money for <laughs> all its depth. So, of course, it's about the collapse of uh, that ideas, ideas of superpower. And, uh, I think it's uh, about the future too. And uh, I decided to paint this uh, piece when I saw uh, meeting before this war against Ukraine. It uh, it's an episode from 1991. Uh, it's the COPE COPE of 1991. 
uh, it was it was an attempt of conservative turn uh, when some ministers decided to to change politics to stop Gorbachev's uh, reforms and to go back to Soviet uh, Soviet rules. Uh, it was mm, happily. It was uh, uh, not not very successful at that moment. But Putin became uh, that turn successful. <laughs> he be- he managed that turn during his time. And uh, when I saw that guys uh, from uh, special uh, how it names. Um, it was uh, it was discussion about this war with uh, some uh, important persons in, uh, in his uh, Putin's, Putin's power. So I thought about that moment, about that cope of nineteen ninety one, and uh, I decided that it's uh, it's a history loop. Be. So history repeat itself. And I painted, it's like a sculpture, it's not just painting, uh, that guys, that uh, policemen uh, dancing Swan Lake. Uh, it was, I thought about that uh, before. So it's it was a mem. It was a symbol of revolution in 1991 because it was the only show on TV during uh, two days of that uh, events of 19 of August 1991. So of course it's about uh, revolution, revolution which uh, about uh, which doesn't happen. And yes, there are some, there are that guys, guys on, on my t-shirt too. And I painted some works about uh, generation, generation of uh, young people who left their country and who uh, lost everything, lost their perspectives, lost their future, and lost their country too. They are going somewhere in that snow desert. Yes, without perspectives. And this one is about generation two. It names Kaga 200. Kaga 200 is a special code for cargo for all transportation from the war with uh, bodies of people who were killed with casualties. So it's a fridge coach with casualties of war with people who were killed there. And this uh, piece also about generations, but uh, about another generation of people, generation who supports Putin uh, and his politics. And uh, it's about nostalgia, nostalgia, which became toxic nowadays. I painted that women standing some way in snow desert with uh, posters, with uh, Soviet slogans. Uh, Communism is a youth of the world. Uh, Our labor is for you, motherland. Communism is a fair future of uh, human of humanity uh, i saw uh, that scene in my hometown in zirzinsk when i visited it uh, once a couple of years ago it was a new holiday which is very very popular holiday now it names uh, day of elderly people and it's a day of uh, nostalgia nostalgia for soviets for Soviet times, and nostalgia for uh, uh, the youth. And it was a mixture of 
the 1st of May and the 7th of November, uh, Soviet holidays. Um, when I painted that women, not uh, from just from photo, but some uh, not very strict from photo with my imagination mainly. I uh, my my mother saw this painting on, on the photo and she said, "Oh, I know that woman, and I know another woman." So she recognized that woman in this photo, and she told me the stories. <laughs> I was very surprised at that. And I painted a huge painting with uh, the fence, with the uh, concrete, concrete wall. And this is a special concrete wall, special shape of the concrete wall designed by uh, Boris Lachman, uh, engineer in 70s, 1970s. And this shape became very popular in all post-Soviet uh, space, uh, especially in Russia. For me, it's a symbol of Putin's time, Putin's politics. And the last painting there on uh, exhibition acting out, uh, it names uh, Time Machine. It's a control panel from Time Machine from very famous film of that time, the film West from the Future. Uh, it's about the beautiful future. Uh, hundred years later, and I found that uh, uh, that control panel and made the copy. So it's uh, very similar to the first painting from that exhibition to the nuclear briefcase, because that nuclear briefcase is also a kind of time machine, but it's a wrong time machine, <laughs> only to stop to stop future to stop everything but i found right time machine <laughs> maybe it's possible to turn it on and maybe skip this terrible time yes and i continue my um, topics that images of this war and behind this war uh, in new series I name it Abyss because it's uh, like uh, something, mm, something behind all uh, my mm, all my landscapes, behind all my life. I feel it's, it's like an Abyss. Yes, and this names uh, the show. It's about violence. One guy beats another guy on the scene, and a lot of people watching that. And it's really terrible. So I feel this wall like this. It's a really terrible show. You cannot stop it. And I painted this uh, spirit of the swamp. And also it was a story about uh, one uh, babushka grandmother. She met uh, Ukrainian power. She, she is uh, from Kharkov suburb and she met uh, Ukrainian uh, forces with the Soviet flag. And after that, uh, she became a symbol of uh, the, this special operation uh, that grandmother with the red flag. So it was like an answer. What are we are doing there? So we are there to you know, to save that that woman with the flag. So it was a kind of answer. And I decided, oh, yes. And they made a lot of uh, graffiti and a lot of paintings. And 
uh, a lot of monuments everywhere in all cities of Russia and uh, also in Mariupol. Uh, here on the right side, right top, uh, this grandmother uh, uh, monument for that grandmother in Mariupol. And on the left side, uh, the same monument, and uh, it's covered with uh, some uh, fabric, red fabric. Uh, so I was so uh, excited, maybe. I was so surprised with that image. It's so terrible. It looks so, so awful. <laughs> so I decided to create uh, painting with a monument. It's like a monument in uh, destroyed Mariupol monument for, of maybe this Russian Spring this special operation. So of course, more information about my works and my projects you can find on my website at adelov.com. So Maybe we can turn to questions and discussions. I have to stop it. Yes. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, that was really uh, fascinating. Um, I recognize some of the paintings there from the exhibition, um, but others I hadn't seen before. Um, I mean, you mentioned at some point when you were speaking about fairy tales, and there's a sort of, I think, a fairy tale element to some of your paintings, but it's like sometimes a dark fairy tale. And something else that you drew on at the exhibition was this idea of utopias and failed utopias, which um, I know from my study of Russian literature and so on has a very deep resonance in Russian culture. There's always been... Um, the search for utopias. I mean, would you like to say something about, about that in your painting? About utopia? Uh, yes. So, of course, it's more in late paintings, uh, late works, uh, which uh, after post-war <laughs> paintings, post-war works. And I thought about that utopia and uh, nostalgia for Soviet times. Uh, in my exhibition, Acting Out, it was uh, a song, it was a melody from the very famous song from Soviet film, Guest from the Future. It's about the future, and uh, there, there are words in that, that song. Uh, the beautiful future, the beautiful far, don't be cruel for me. Uh, so it, it's like a prayer for the, for the future. It's like, uh, uh, maybe, yes, waiting for the better future. And uh, now it's don't, now it's changed. And it's not about the future. It's about the future in the past. So this idea of Soviet utopia is idea of uh, the future in the past. It's not a real future. It's not a future for us, but it's a future how it was uh, maybe uh, how we can imagine it in 70s or 80s. <laughs> so it's impossible future, of course. It's more about the past time. And that's interesting how you counterpose the two generations, you know, the older generation with their nostalgia and so on, and the younger generation who in that very powerful painting are lost in in the snow or the mist, um, don't seem to have any future, sort of exiled from everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... It was my feeling. I I, uh, I thought about myself this way as, uh, uh, as a person lost uh, without without perspectives. So, 
Of course, uh, it was not only after Putin launched this war. It was step by step before. It was earlier, and it was after uh, maybe a memorial organization was closed after uh, political uh, different uh, uh, when when opposition became criminalized criminalized uh, when it was impossible to uh, say something against. Putin's politics. Uh, so it, uh, this feeling is not the feeling, uh, the only feeling of this year, of the last year. Maybe uh, the gradual, gradual it's, development. Yeah, yeah, it's really a terrible feeling that uh, we are separate. We are not together. We cannot uh, do something together. We cannot change. The, I cannot uh, join somebody and. Nobody will join me. This feeling is really terrible. So it's like, uh, are you somewhere uh, with other people, but uh, with the distance, with some distance? I really love your painting of the missile silo with the money. Um, I mean, it's you know, it's fact. You know, fact is stranger than fiction. And um, you know, there's so much humor in that. I mean, just it's just sort of black humor, really. Um, yeah. That money is just poured into a pit in the ground, which itself is a weapon of, you know, destruction. Um, I think it's a, one, a, a wonderful image. Um, yeah, I was very surprised, but uh, that it's non-fiction. It's not. It's a real story. You can find that uh, Silas is in different areas in the Kostromskaya and. Uh, Vladimirske in Yaroslavske uh, regions of Russia, different different places, and in in other countries too, but they are not filled with money. There, yeah. they are just empty. Rowan, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Pavel, for the uh, fantastic lecture and, and, and art. Um, it's incredibly poignant and powerful. Um, and, and it's been a wonderful opportunity this evening to um, hear what you have to say. I'm, I'm very interested in, in utopia. My, my area of study is utopian studies. And I'm quite interested in this idea of, of the contrast between that and nostalgia. Um, a really disturbing thing in in Britain and the US, and then I see a lot online is younger people being drawn into nostalgia politics, especially for um, places that are othered. I mean, Russia being an example with a sort of wave of interest in uh, Stalinism and and these ideas of um, you know, resurrecting Stalinist realism to counteract the politics that we have here, um, which is obviously completely detached from either reality itself, the reality of, of the Stalinist system, the reality of, of Russia yeah. uh, as it was then, but also detached from the experience that younger people have actually had uh, in their own lives and seems to express a lot of resentments. Mm -hmm. So I was very interested in this idea of Nostalgia also is a thing that infects the young as well as a kind of uh, last resort politics when I think, as you described very eloquently, that sense of agency, that ability to collectively change your own political environment is is robbed from people. But mostly I just wanted to thank you for, for the fantastic art and, and for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, it's not the only problem of... Uh... Russian and uh, for Soviet countries, this nostalgia, because it's uh, common for different different places, different countries. But uh, especially in Russia, uh, this nostalgia became real, really toxic because uh, Putin's politics, his politics, uh, based on that nostalgia for Soviet times. Uh, of course, Trump's politics too. Uh, but uh, it, it's possible to, to change here. <laughs> Russians cannot uh, 
uh, change. Okay, power. Uh, Terry. Thanks. Yes, that was incredibly powerful. Um, two very different questions. Um, I was interested in the gender politics of, of some of the images and the way that particularly that well, it, it's there in the babushka, and I can I can understand that because it's taking what they did. But the I was particularly struck by the 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 painting of I don't remember how many it is. I I didn't get round to counting, but maybe a dozen women um, mm. as as the image of of, of nostalgia. And and I was interested in how much that was a reflection of what Putin and his apparatchiks do in terms of using women. Because on the other hand, you've got powerful images of younger women in the you know standing up against the war and 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 so on so i i was quite interested in that and then on a completely different subject can you talk about the painting behind you because i've been fascinated with <laughs> ever since yeah by the way why women only on that painting uh uh when i was there in uh, zerzhinsk and I saw that uh, people coming to scene uh, with the posters and the balls and flags, Soviet flags, Soviet symbolics. It was women only. I was very surprised that uh, maybe uh, because of it's uh, there are a lot of chemical city uh, chemical factors there, and not a lot of men uh, still alive after sixty. At the 60s and i saw maybe a couple of men there in uh, the, all that uh, concert on that meeting uh on the women <laughs> i was very surprised maybe women uh, also women are more powerful more active at that age <laughs> and so uh it was based on uh, on a real, real, real situation, real event. Yes, and uh, what else? And by the way, I... about not everybody uh, support Putin, of course, and in that uh, age, and uh, not. Everybody who is with Soviet symbolic support uh, Putin's politic, exactly. Because uh, my mother, for example, she is against the war and against uh, Putin, Putin's politics too. And she had even uh, let us know to a war on her back. And he, she, she, she is very brave. She. Uh, was everywhere with that back first days when this war started and uh, she was on uh, she took part in soviet uh, events post-soviet events uh, maybe for pioneers day and i saw her with uh, the red uh, scarf the red pioneer scarf uh, but she's against against politics of course it's not about uh, about it it's, it's not equivalent things uh, but it's about tendency <laughs> and uh, Putin's politics use that people people who have Soviet nostalgia to create something really terrible to maybe to come back to the, to the past of course it's a possible idea I think the second question was about the painting on the wall behind you. 
Oh, yes, yes. Mm. It's now signal painting. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, also about Soviet TV. I painted some works that are, uh, you cannot find them on my website because I just started it before the war. And when uh, in the end of uh, 2000, uh, 2021, in the end of 2021, I painted blocks uh, from the time program. It was a Soviet program, a uh, Soviet TV program, news, news program. And before that news, it was a uh, clock, clock on the blue background. So I started with that image. Uh, of course, it's a suspense image when you, you are waiting for news, when you are waiting for something. And I decided to paint some uh, works uh, based on that uh, image from Soviet TV with, uh, uh, when you are waiting for something. And it's about uh, that uh, TV too. And when Everything is closed. Everything is finished. You can see that uh, stripe of different colors. But uh, there is another thing that colors are not. Uh, this is not really uh, yellow. This is not really blue. It's, it's uh, special uh, shades of uh, real colors. So it's also about propaganda <laughs> because. You cannot find real colors. You cannot find uh, real things there on TV. It shows everything changed. So, and uh, what else? And I decided to paint it here because of uh, here in London, there is a company uh, which asks to pay for TV. Uh, it's it's not free here. <laughs> and I've got, I received a letter about uh, TV, uh, so I have to pay for one year 150 pounds for TV. But I never had TV set there, and I have no TV. <laughs> so I decided to paint <laughs> this TV set and <laughs> put it uh, in the hole. That's an interesting like, like, strategy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yvonne asks in the chat, and I know Yvonne is an artist herself. Um, she loved the door installation and the deconstructed nuclear briefcase. Very powerful and sometimes nihilistic imagery. Uh, the door installation, uh, what does it mean, the door installation? I think it's in, in uh, Chelyabinsk, was it, when you had the exhibition? Ah, in Chelyabinsk, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. Thank you. So so you say you're working on yeah. You're working on a new collection now, the Abyss. You know, you've you've shown one or two of Yes, uh, I continue. Yes, yeah. I continue this collection uh with Abyss. Yeah. And so probably you'll have an exhibition maybe well maybe later this year or something. Yeah, I hope. I hope so. Uh, I'm not sure because I have no uh, galleries here and no special uh, contacts to, to create exhibition uh, yet. Uh, maybe oh. if I if I will have opportunity, of course. Are, are there any other questions from anybody or comments? Well, Pavel, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. It's been a fascinating evening. The, the paintings are just marvellous. Um, and certainly we will stay in touch with you and possibly ask you maybe to come back, you know, at a later date when we will hopefully have more people. And uh, we'll certainly follow your, your career with great interest. So thank you again, Pavel. Thank you, Joseph. Um, thank you, everybody. For coming this evening. Yeah. Okay.